Well, as many of you guys know, I like to smoke. Neat, that is. I don't know where you guys were thinking. I mean, I know we're in Colorado, but I love to get the smoker out, and I love to make some brisket or, or, or some pulled pork. And, but if, if, if you are a griller or, or, you, or a smoker, you know that there are certain things you have to do to, to make the meat right. Any, any grillers in the room today? A few hands. Any, any smokers, meat, meat smokers, bar- barbecue <laughs> smokers in the room? As you guys know, it, it's a little different. And so if you're going to make some delicious pulled pork, let's say you're smoking a pork shoulder, it's going to be cooked differently than if you're going to make some pork chops. You know, if you need to make some pork chops, you're going to throw them on the grill. You're going to make sure they get to about 145 degrees. And that's when uh, the FDA says it's safe to, to eat. And, but not so with a pork shoulder, not so with pulled pork. You've got to cook it till there's an internal temperature of 195 to 205 degrees. Now, you might say, well, why would I do that? That will burn it. It'll dry it out, but it's not true. When you smoke something at low heat, there are certain boundaries you have to stay into to get it to become tender. And so at that temperature, between 195 and 205, the collagens break down and the meat becomes tender. And so there's these boundaries that you have to follow if you want it to be right. Now, a few weeks ago, I made a, a, pulled, or a pork shoulder, and it was great. And I, I talked to a buddy. He told me exactly how to do it, and it was fantastic. So I arrogantly thought I knew what I was doing. And instead of going and reading the recipes and calling the buddy again and finding out, I just decided to do it myself. And the problem was that it was 10 o'clock at night and Courtney and I decided we wanted it for the next day. And I said, let's cut some corners. I'm going to crank the heat a little bit and I'm going to throw it in the oven without foil. And we woke up the next day and I forgot to tell her what internal temperature to pull it from. So she looks it up, 145, perfect. We pull it out throw it in to let it rest. I come home to, to, car, or to, to shred it, and let me tell you, it was like carving through a saddle, right? I mean, it just was bad. And I realized I got outside the boundaries. I did not get within the range I needed to be. And I think in life, this happens a lot. In everything in life, we have boundaries. We have boundaries in our relationships. We have, we have boundaries when it comes to um, our careers and, and how we work. We have boundaries when it comes to the way we cook our meat and all these different things. And uh, the, the, the way you keep from, from drying out or, or getting outside the boundaries is you really have two ways you can go. One, you can learn life the hard way, which all of us can look back at our life and say, yep, been there, done that, learned the hard way. The second path is to learn through the way of wisdom. And the way of wisdom is to, to speak to people who know what they're talking about. Uh, for my case, it's to call Joe Richardson and Hunter Wilson. Uh, he's in the back if you need to talk to him. He can tell you what you need to know. But, you know, if you need to do a home project, what do you do? You pull up YouTube and watch six videos on how to reframe a door. Whatever it is, there's the way of wisdom. And so I, I think the, the question for us is, in, in your life and the challenges you've been through or the season you're in now, how, how do you learn the boundaries? How do you define the, the boundaries that you, you need to stay within when it comes to the friendships, it comes to your marriage, it comes to your career, the way, way you spend your money? How do you stay within the boundaries? And, and are you trying to learn the hard way or are you trying to learn through the way of wisdom? If you've been with us the past seven-ish months, going into eight months, we've been walking through a series called The Greater Story. And in the greater story, we're walking through the entire Bible, seeing that God has given us one story from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and seeing how that unfolds. And we've been spending the last couple of weeks in the heart of the Old Testament, 1 Samuel, as we get to see the kings of Israel. And, and this week, we're going to uh, learn about King David, and we're going to see that King David crossed outside the boundaries, and he ended up paying big time for it. But for us... It serves as a cautionary tale so we can learn to identify the boundaries and stay inside of them. If you were with us last week, Pastor Ron did an amazing job of teaching us really the life of David as David became king and and sought to be a man after God's own heart and sought to be this leader that that God really set as the example to be be the king of Israel. And and as we we see about David at at the very end of, of, of Ron's sermon, he talked about the fact that God made a covenant with David and said, David, it's through your line that I'm going to bring the one who's going to come save the world someday. And we know that to be Jesus. And so God put David in a place and said, David, be my guy. Well, we we see that if if you're in the book of of 2 Samuel, we see that the the next four chapters after that, 2 Samuel 7, God gives this covenant to David. 2 Samuel 8, 9, 10, and 10, you see this just great description of David's mighty victories. 
I mean, David is the, is, is, is the king. He's leading his people out in war. He's fighting back the, 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 the enemies. And, and you just continue to see, like, win after win. David does everything right. He, he defeats the Philistines. They defeat the, uh, the Edomites. And the Lord gives victory everywhere. But then things slow down in chapter 11. Things come to a halt at chapter 11. And you begin to see some warning signs of where David's beginning to get outside the boundary. So if, if you have your Bible, I want to look together with, with uh, th- this picture. It's just the, uh, the, the picture uh, of, of David who had a banner career, banner success, was the king of all kings at the time. And then we see he falls himself into a terrible situation in Samuel chapter 11 when he meets Bathsheba. And some of you may know this story. I want to unfold it a little bit for us today. And, and I think one of the, the questions I want to ask is, is this. Look at David's life. He's having a banner career, lots of success. Can someone, can you, can I, can we tear down a life of usefulness in one bad afternoon? I think we're going to see that. With, we're going to see David try. And so I guess the question for us as we look around is, have we seen examples of this? And I think we have. I think we can look through the news and we can count countless times where that has happened and uh, pe- people said something they shouldn't have said or made a financial decision they shouldn't have made and, and all of a sudden they're, 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 a life of success seems to be tainted and we see David had so much success and now we see that it's tainted but there's several warning signs for you and I to pick up from that I think can help us to flourish and to be the people God created us to be. So notice with me, let's start here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Notice what we read. It says, in the spring of the year, in the spring of the year, the time came when the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab, his, his general, his commander, and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But, but notice the end of verse 1. But David remained at Jerusalem. And so in, in those days, the king would ride out, they'd lead their people in the battle, and, and they'd ride out, and the people would be excited and fired up because the king is with them. But David's been king. He's had a lot of success. It's been years now where they've been defeating the bad guys. And so David stays home. And, and so here, here's the question. Do you want to avoid wrecking your life? Well, then there's several warning signs we can pick up from David's life. And the first warning sign is this. We need to pay attention to our location. If you're taking notes, pay attention to your location. I mean, no, no, notice again, here's David. Notice where he is. David found himself in the wrong place. David should have been with his men. He should have been out in the field. He should have been leading and, and commanding, but instead he, he sent his commander. And it was his right to send his commander out. I mean, he was the king. But he found himself in the wrong, in the wrong place. You know, there's that old saying that idle hands are the, the devil's playground. Chapter 11 should have been another chapter about David's victories. Chapter 11 should have been another chapter about David's conquest and the amazing thing he's done. But instead, chapter 11 is a, a dreadful chapter. And it starts because David had a a dangerous amount of leisure time because he wasn't where he should have been. You know, I think back over these last two plus years of of COVID, I want you to ask yourself, how much leisure time have you had? I mean, I think when COVID first hit, we're all like, man, this is good, right? No more kids games, right? I I can can just kick back and I can binge all those shows that that Ron's been telling me about for all these years and it's going to be good. But after a while, we, you know, you started started to realize we've got a little too much time on our hands. And I think for some of us, we've continued to have a little too much time on our hands. There's, There's a danger when we have too much leisure time on our hands, when we're not being productive. And sometimes in our, in our convenience, we allow ourselves to be in the wrong place. And I think there's a reality here. We see it, David. It's implicit here that, that sin often starts out small. And if you look at your life, you, you know it's true. Sin often starts out small. It's not that big of a deal. I'm just going to kind of let it do this at this one time. I'm going to let it slide this one time. And, and then all of a sudden, it begins to, to pick up steam. And, and I begin to, like cr- uh, Cast of Crown says, it becomes this slow fade. It seems innocent, innocent enough. And so David, I'm going to relax today. I'm going to relax here. And he found himself in the wrong place where temptations began to grip his heart. When I was in college, I, I needed a philosophy credit. When I was going to University of Missouri, I needed philosophy credit. So I decided I was going to take a philosophy of war class. I thought it sounded fun. Any philosophy majors in here? Anybody ever read Sun Tzu, The Art of War? One. Two. Oh, we got three of us. Okay. We can talk later. Um, 
not nearly as exciting as it sounds. I'm just going to be honest with you. And that class was like the most boring class ever. But Sun Tzu was interesting because you think it's all about like battle formations, but instead it's the philosophy behind war. And he has a quote in, in that book that was interesting. He, he, here's what he says. He says, do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. Right? If, if, you're, if your army is in an isolated position, you're going to get hemmed in. And if you're there too long, well, then you're going to be attacked. And you're going to lose your stronghold. And the same is true for us, isn't it, in life? You ever rubbed elbows a little too long in an area you know you shouldn't have? You find yourself in a place where you're lingering in a dangerous position. And that's right where the enemy wants to come in and grab your heart. Uh, Often your convenience has become the greatest place of compromise. So when we find that we are in a place of convenience and it's easy and we are not where we should be, we are often in the greatest place of compromise. So instead of going to war, which David should have been doing something else, right? Making swords, writing contracts, right? Like leading uh, leadership camps, but instead he was lingering in a dangerous position. And notice what happens. Verse 2. Notice what happens in verse 2. It says, And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. So notice, he's got too much time on his hands. He's on the roof. He's, he's in a dangerous location, and he sees something that draws his attention. Now, now, remember, this is the part of the world we're talking, this is Jerusalem, this is the middle, you know, this is Israel, right? The, the Middle East, and it's hot. So it's very hot, and, and so David's taking an afternoon siesta. I love an afternoon siesta. I took one this week. It was fantastic. Like, it was good. If you, you should take one today if you haven't taken one in a while. But they're so good. But I love a good afternoon siesta, but, you know, like a Sunday afternoon, you fall asleep during the third quarter because your team's down, right? And you wake up at the end of the game, and you're, like, refreshed. Well, this was too long of an afternoon siesta because now it's, it's late in the afternoon. He's been sleeping too long because he's not very productive and he doesn't have enough to do. David was making bad use of his time. So second warning if you want to keep from wrecking your life, pay attention to how you use your time. David was not using his time wisely. He was sleeping all afternoon and he saw something from the roof that led him to temptation, caught his eye and led him to lust. He saw Bathsheba. He saw someone beautiful. And, and often, I think what we, happen, what we happen to see in our lives is when we find that we're in a place of compromise, what, what ends up happening is we, we find ourselves in a place where we're beginning to let our guard down. And so anything can cloud our vision and pull our eyes away. So rather than focusing on doing what David should have been doing, being the king, he was wrong place, wrong time, sleeping all day, and now he's compromised himself and he's, his eyes have been stolen away. I think I've told you guys before about the, Jane, the, the, the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, it's so good. It, it, it's so good. And one of the things James talks about is, in the book Atomic Habits, he talks about choice architecture. And he says so many times the, the choices you make in life are, are, are based on your environment. They're, they're based on the, the things that, that you see. So he tells a story about a hospital. And, and there's a hospital administrator, and the hospital wants to, pe- to start selling more water than soda. That the, the vending machines are selling soda all day while people are in waiting rooms. They want to start selling water. So what they did was they took the, the, um, the soda machines and they pushed them down the hallway and they took the water uh, vending machines and they put them in all the visible places. So anytime you walked into a, into a waiting room, there was a water machine. Anytime you walked into a, a populated area, there was a, a machine selling water again. And they found that over time, the sale of water went up 25%. This is the reason that when you walk into the grocery store, you see a kiosk with Lay's potato chips and Diet Pe- Dr. or Dr. Pepper, right? Because, I mean, these companies spend millions of dollars getting your grocery stores because they know what you see is what you're going to want to get. And so there's this idea of, of how do we change our environment? How do we look at different things? James Clear says this, great quote. He says, environment is the invisible hand that shapes human behavior. Think about that, that your environment Where you find yourself and what you find yourself looking at is the invisible hand. That's so good, isn't it? That shapes your behavior. And notice what he says. To change your behavior, you have to change your environment. Now, you might say, well, yeah, yeah, obviously, that makes sense. But then why do we still do it, right? Why do we still compromise our environment? Why do we we still get close enough that it's going to become a, a, a temptation? So here's the question I want you to ask yourself. What do you allow your eyes to see? And in your leisure time, what are you looking at? 
We've all got a screen in our hands often. What do we sing? What do we allow to influence? What, 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 are we, what are we reading? What news outlets are we taking in? What, what shows are we watching? Because often, when we've compromised, we get tired, we get weary, and weary plus opportunity can equal failure. And so we've got to be careful where we are. So here's the question. We all need a release. We all need rest. We all need to do things that we enjoy that fill our cup. Do you have a productive release or a destructive release? What are your habits? What are the things you like to do? What are your hobbies? The choices you're to make, yours to make. Now, here's a question. If you know the story about David and Bathsheba, we often think that David's on the roof over here and he looks over here and Bathsheba's bathing on the roof too, right? Anybody ever thought that? I think often we're like, why is she on the roof taking a bath? Like, any, I don't know, you guys got clawfoot tub on your roof, you know? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. Also, it's hot. It's all sun. Imagine that water. It's not like the hot tub in your backyard. I guess it's going to be boiling. And so... Most scholars think that Bathsheba was actually not on a roof. She was probably in her room. She was probably in her home, in her bathroom, taking a bath. And here's David on the king's palace at the top view, and he's looking in her window. He's like George McFly climbing the tree in Back to the Future. You know what I'm talking about? He's got his binoculars out and all that stuff. I mean, I think it's another warning here. Notice, pay attention to your curiosity. I mean, imagine David, he's up there, he's doing his thing, he's got a cigar or whatever, and he's looking around, and he looks over, and he sees a guy doing push-ups, and over here, this lady's hanging some laundry, and then he looks in, and he sees Bathsheba. He's curious, right? It's kind of like, like if, if I'm out, and I see a Lamborghini, right? I look over, it's the new Murcielago, and I'm like, oh, man, that's a good-looking car. But what happens when you look twice, right? You're like, oh, man, that's a, oh, man. That's a good-looking car, right? Start walking as close as you're looking around to make sure the owner doesn't come out. You know, you're looking. Like, imagine David. He's curious. He's looking in her window. You see this, 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 this idea that what often leads us to a place of compromise is that we begin to, to wrestle with this curiosity. You say, well, I didn't mean to do that, but I just clicked that link because I just wanted to see it was interesting. You know, I just was curious what was on the other side of the curtain. And, and so our curiosity can take us down a path we never meant to go in, but we didn't guard our curiosity. And, and so I, I think that's, this is a good question that we have to, to think about here is God has wired us to be curious, but the enemy wants to take your curiosity and the way that God wired you, and he wants to use that for bad. And so the question is, again, like, what are we spending our time doing? When we're curious about something, where does it take us? Because it's often not where you go first, it's where that door opens to take you next. So are you watching a documentary or are you watching a show with some things you probably shouldn't be seeing because that's going to potentially open the door to you for you to go somewhere else. I think we just need to learn to, to guard our curiosity. And, and when we look once, we just got to learn to try to keep ourselves from looking again because it's usually the second look that catches our heart. Ben Stewart, he's a pastor in D.C., says this. He says that many of the greatest sins in our life starts with a distortion of cu- our curiosity. Curiosity is a good thing. God has designed you to be curious. Make sure you guard it, though. So notice what happens. His curiosity sends him, causes him to send a messenger to find out who she was. And so notice this. It says in verse 3 that David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, and, and then uh, one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And so David sends one of his guys over to ask about that Bathsheba. He's curious, Who, who's that woman in there that I saw? And they come back and they're like, um, so, so David, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of your buddy and the wife of your other buddy? You know, like, hint, hint, David, don't be stupid. Like, you know her, you know her family, don't make this mistake. And David should have caught this. He should have been wise enough to catch this warning. He had somebody trying to be a, keep him accountable do you have somebody to help keep you accountable when your curiosity leads you in? So notice how fast things go from uh, curiosity to temptation to compromise. Look at this in verse 4. So David sent messengers and took her. She came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived and sent and told David, I am pregnant. Notice it slowed down, and then there to pick back up in a couple weeks, she comes back and says, David, I'm pregnant. And everything just shattered because David allowed compromise 
and it has now led to this mistake. And, and now David is trying to figure out what he's going to do. And so verse 4, so we, we look here at verse 4. I think there's something that stands out to us that I think we should take, take to heart here. It says this, that you can't stop outcomes, but you can control what you input. I mean, you often can't stop what, what happens. You can't necessarily stop consequences, but you can control your inputs. It, David could have controlled his inputs, but he didn't. And I think one of the things that we can miss often is when, when you go through 1 Samuel and, and 2 Samuel really quickly, you realize that, that, that by this point, David had five wives. And so David is beginning to linger in places that he shouldn't have been lingering. His appetite was growing. He, he was beginning to become more hungry. I don't know about you guys, but during COVID-19, I think I gave, gained the COVID-19, you know? And, and I think it was just because instead of eating a salad from from Target for lunch, you're grazing on your kids' Cheez-Its all day, right? And, and I think it's easy to happen. You guys know what, what that is so often like. A little compromise can lead to big consequences. And so how do we learn to control what we input so it doesn't dictate the negative outcome? There's this verse in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, where Solomon says, um, you can't throw heaps of fire on your lap and not burn your shirt. You can't walk on coals of fire with not burning your feet. And I think sometimes we, we, we don't realize this. We, we don't dictate the inputs, but then we're really upset with the outcome. So, so notice what happens. David finds out that Bathsheba's pregnant, and he, he wants to fix the problem. So notice what happens here in verse 6. And uh, we see, so David sent word to Joab. He said, send me Uriah the Hittite. Because remember, the guys are out on the field. They're, they're fighting. They're, they're winning wars. And he said, send me Uriah. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to David, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing. He's making some small talk and how, how the war was going. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. And Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So the imagery here is Uriah comes in. David's like, hey, Uriah, how's it going on the battlefield, man? He's like, it's great. Why am I here? He's like, well, tell you what. Go home, wash your feet, and here's a gift, some wine, some cheese, some Marvin Gaye CDs, you know, some Luther Vandross, a little Anita, and everything's going to be fine. And he, he, but he refuses to go home, and he sleeps at the door of the king's house. And so David's like, oh my gosh, what is, what is going on? And it bothers David. So David brings it back and he's like, why didn't you go home, man? And he's like, why should I go home? My brothers are out there fighting at war. And, and I'm here for some weird reason. Why would I go home when my brothers are dying on the battlefield? And, and I think there's a truth here we see with David. David kind of gets ticked off. And I think this bothers David because nothing is more bothersome when you're living in sin than the integrity of someone else. And so David sees his integrity, and he feels cut to the quick. But he's faced with this decision. He's, do I confess with what happened? Do I tell Uriah, hey, here's what happened. Let's make it right. Because right then, if he would have confessed, they could have worked through it. There's redemption on the other side of that. It could have been a beautiful renewal. Would it have taken time? Probably. But it would have been gorgeous if he would have confessed to Uriah and Bathsheba, and they bring together, and God could redeem that situation. David could have done that. But instead, he makes another decision. And his other decision brings it all really to a terrible place. David sends Uriah back out to the front line. And in his, le- in his hand, in Uriah, his friend's hand, Uriah was one of David's 30. In Uriah's hand, he takes a letter with his own death sentence back to the general. N- notice, notice what happens here in verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, send Uriah to the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he he knew there would be valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Notice David wanted just Uriah to pass away, but Joab knew that's sloppy. That's messy. I can't just do that. More of the mighty men died. More of the soldiers died. And it's another warning that we need to remember here, that our sin never just impacts us, that our sin impacts other people. There's always a trickle down. There's always someone else that is impacted. And some of you in your life, 
have been the recipient of that, and some of us have been the cause of that. And, and God knows, God forgives, God gives us grace, God gives us mercy, God's love is so good. But if David would have just got out in front of it, it would have saved this. But man, the, the, the sin now impacted other families. It, it's never just me. And so Uriah dies. David takes Bathsheba to be his wife. He probably feels like the problem is solved. And then notice what happens. Verse 27, very bottom of the chapter, very last verse of the chapter. Notice what it says. So he, he took Bathsheba to be his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David thought he got away with it. David thought everybody was okay. David thought nobody saw, but God saw. And in chapter 12, notice how this exchange happens. So chapter 12, we see that God calls up Nathan. Notice this. And the Lord sent Nathan. Nathan was a prophet, a prophet in Israel at the time of David. He said, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and he told him a story. And this is a beautiful story. Catch this. He says this. There were, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up. And it grew up with, me, with him and with his children. It used to eat out of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And if you look at the Hebrew in that, it's bat Sheba. It sounds like Bathsheba, doesn't it? I mean, God is bringing it to David, and David doesn't see it yet. And notice this. He says, now, verse 4, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or her to prepare the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come. So the rich man then want to use his stuff, goes to the poor man, takes the poor man's lamb, even though it's the only one he has, and he prepares it for his guest. Now, David hears this story, thinks it's a true story, and he gets so mad. Look at verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And notice what Nathan says to him. Nathan says to David, David, you are the man. Right there, David. David, you took what you're right. You, David, you got a lot of kids. You've been married. Uriah, this is his wife. You took you are the man. And he says this. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And then he says this in verse nine. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. He's saying, why have you despised me? He said, Uriah and Bathsheba, I'm for them. They're my people. Why have you done this? If you would have asked me for something else, I would have given it to you, David. Why did you do this? And he gives David no wiggle room for excuses. And I, I think it brings up a reality for us. It's this, that what happens in the dark will eventually be brought into the light. It, what happens that we think people don't know about, God sees it. And eventually he's going to bring it up. Eventually, he's going to bring it into our life, so we have to deal with it. We can't just keep things under the rug. God wants us to deal with it because as we deal with it, that's where the hope comes and the joy comes and the peace comes from, of realizing that we're not perfect, but that Jesus came and gave his life for us to forgive us of our sin, to lead us into living the life in the kingdom of God where we can be people who flourish and people who live in pursuit of the person God called us to be. Jesus says this in Luke 8, 17. I won't put it on the screen. I'll just read it. He says, For all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. Back in 2015, you guys might remember the website Ashley Madison, an online hookup website. Well, the names got released, 32 million names. Many reputable people who thought they would always be concealed was brought into the light. And I think the reality is that we just have to deal with things first and early and confess and repent of them and get them out of the way so that we can be freed from that and pursue Jesus. So notice David's consequence. Verse 10, it says this in verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. R remember when David got mad a few verses ago and he said, that man needs to pay him back fourfold for his lamb? Well, we're gonna see that David actually gets a fourfold judgment. Four of David's sons pass away. The son he has with Bathsheba loses her life. 
And then later on, because of David's bad leadership, this decision just sent David down the wrong path because of David's bad leadership. One of his sons sexually assaults one of his daughters from a different marriage. David doesn't do anything about it, so his son Absalom kills his son Amnon. So there's two. Then Absalom, so mad at his dad because he didn't do anything about, about Tamar, and so mad at his dad because he's a bad leader, decides to go and revolt against David and take the kingdom from him. And so Absalom dies at the hand of Joab, David's commander. That's three. And then a little bit later, David's fourth son, Adonijah, tries to grab the throne away from before Solomon can take it when David's old. And David's brother kills him. The sword never departed David's house. David experienced four consequence because of his sin. And it just could have all been solved if David would have confessed and repented. It could have all been solved if David would have not lingered in dangerously isolated positions. And so, so, so notice, so David's been called out. Notice what he does. Look at this. This is verse 13. And this is a key verse in this, this account. It says this, but David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Notice David doesn't go, well, you know, God, why'd you make me king? You you knew I couldn't handle this temptation. Or or God, why didn't you you make her put a shade up in her bedroom? Or God, if this wouldn't have happened, if, if, if I wouldn't have got that email, God, if that person wouldn't have called right at that time. David's like, God, I've sinned. You're right. I've made a mistake. Notice what God says to David. Notice this. Verse 13, B, it says this. Nathan says to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Wait, what? David just did something horrible. He sent Uriah to his death. And God's saying, I'm just going to pass over your sin? That seemed pretty light. Doesn't it seem like God should have done something more? I think sometimes, it's funny, we, we think God in the Old Testament is too judgmental, right? Like, God, that is hardcore. But yet we read this story, we're like, God, you're not judgmental enough. David needs more than that. Well, remember, David still con- experiences the consequences. Four of his sons die. The whole thing falls apart a generation later. But, but notice, even though God didn't take away his consequences, by, by, God, by David repenting, God says, I will not remove my promises. See, this is the reality that we have, guys. When we make mistakes in our life, and we do, we're human. When we make mistakes in our life, there's consequences that come from those mistakes, and we've all experienced those at different levels in our lives. But here's the beautiful thing. When we know Jesus, and when we have said yes to Jesus, and when we are pursuing Jesus, and when we are confessing and repenting of our sin, God's promises never leave, no matter how much we mess up. Isn't that great news? That God's promises are always true. And so God says, David, I will not pull my promises from you, even though you're going to experience some consequences. And notice the word he uses. God will pass over your sin. A few months ago, we talked about in the book of Exodus, the Passover, remember? And we said in the Passover that God doesn't, God doesn't uh, just, just like, ah, sin doesn't matter. He transfers sin. So in the Passover, sin was transferred to a lamb. And that's the beautiful picture of how sin would be transferred to David's future son, Jesus. Notice what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 5. He says this, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the what? The righteousness in him. That Jesus came and God transferred, he passed over our sin because it's been transferred to Jesus. Forefront, that is amazing news. That God forgives, that he, God is merciful, that God is full of grace. God says all sin is going to be paid for. And here's the reality. All sin will be paid for either in eternity in hell or on the cross of Jesus. We need it on the cross of Jesus. And this beautiful reality is this, that God's mercies are always new. Guys, no matter what you've been through, no matter how many challenges you've had in your life, God's mercies are always new. I love that verse in Lamentations chapter 3, 22 and 23. It says that God's mercies never end and they are new every morning. No matter what happened last night, last year, 10 years ago, God's mercies are new right now. God's mercies are gonna be new tomorrow. God's mercies are gonna be new the day after that. And so we are people who have fallen short because of sin. 
And we need the cross of Jesus. And we have a Savior who is better than David, who is better than Moses, who is better than Abraham, who is better than Adam. We have Jesus. And he took it all on himself. I want you to notice how the story ends. So a little later in chapter 12, it says that that David um, comforted Bathsheba after her, her baby passed away. Really, really sad situation. And he went in and delayed with her, and she bore a son, and she called his name Solomon. Solomon, based on the root word shalom, someone say shalom. It means peace, completeness, wholeness. And so they named him Peace. They had went through a season where there was no peace. And they have a baby and they name him Peace. But notice this. This is beautiful. Notice how the, 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 the verse ends. Verse 24, it says, And the Lord loved him. He loved Solomon. And he sent a message to Nathan by the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah. What a good name, right? Jedidiah. Somebody say Jedidiah. Yeah. Name, name your next dog Jedidiah. And the dog, he named his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Solomon means peace. You know what Jedidiah means? Beloved. So God says, yeah, you, you, you name him peace. That's, that's good. I'm naming him loved. I'm naming him beloved. Was he born from a really messy situation? Yeah, but I love him because he's my son. And the beautiful thing is that God is saying to each of you today that he loves you because he is your son and he is your daughter and you are a child of God and he created you to be in relationship with him and to live in the kingdom that he has created. And that means that you don't have to carry around that guilt and that shame, that you don't have to carry around that sin. You can lay all that at the feet of Jesus. You can have peace and you can have joy because you are loved. And when we can learn to live within the boundaries of life that God has given us, it's in those moments that we realize that we've been freed and rescued and redeemed. And it's in those moments we realize that we can pursue joy, peace, and hope because we are the beloved. So here's my challenge to you. Here's our next step this week. Spend some time with Jesus and be reminded as you're in his word that you're loved, that nothing, as Paul says, will separate you from the love of of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. You are loved. And so lay that at his feet. And I I also encourage you, spend some time with someone else who loves Jesus this week because they'll remind you that they love you too. And that God has put people in in our lives to encourage us and lead us to walk in the fellowship of this new community called the church. So spend some time with Jesus. Spend some time with those who love Jesus and watch what God does in your heart. Would you pray with me?